Hallelujah. The name of Jesus is a strong tower. The righteous run into it and they are safe. Is he your tower today? Is he your tower? Jesus, the most wonderful name of all names. Jesus, the only name that brings healing. Jesus. 
if we can raise our hands up in this place in unity today. Oh, Jesus, raise your hands. Hallelujah. There's no other name. No other name. No other name. I know. No other name. No other name. I know. No other name. No other name. I know. There's no other name that we must be saved. It is only through His name. Hallelujah. your presence in this place, oh God, tear down those strongholds, oh, there's no other name, there's no other name, hallelujah, oh, oh. be exalted, Jesus, oh, be exalted, Lord. our hands. We surrender to you, Lord, today. Be exalted. Oh, be exalted. Over our families, Jesus. We allow you to reign in our homes, Lord. Be exalted, oh Jesus. Touch the minds of our children, oh God. We pray, oh Lord, that you would cover them, Jesus. Oh God, we are Lord. We bless your name. Oh, there's no other name, no other name. Oh, God, there's no other name. Hallelujah. There's no other name, no other name. There's no other name. That's the only name that we can call on when we need a hallelujah. Oh, there's no other name. Call upon that name today, hallelujah. Yes, there's no other name. No other name. No, no other name. Be exalted, Jesus. excitement that I have when I'm praising God. Great and mighty is our God. I've come here today because I serve a mighty God, a risen God. I didn't come here for some dead God that doesn't answer my prayers. I've come for a God that has touched my family, a God who has made provisions in my life. When we were short on money, God came through. When we didn't have food on the table, God delivered. When there was things in my body that were going on, God gave me control. And you know what he did? He healed me. God is still in the business of healing. Brother Martin, God is a healer. He can heal your body. He is going to heal your body in the name of Jesus. There is nothing that the enemy can come against us with. We just let not have to let our faith rise in him. So this morning, church, great and mighty is our God. Great and mighty is our God. Great and mighty is our God. Great and mighty is our 
our God. mighty God. He's victorious. He's our undefeated King. He's our King of Kings and Lord of Lords. 
He's a very present help in the time of trouble. Hallelujah. Great and mighty when I hear that song and it just sounds majestic. And I can imagine our Lord just walking in. Amen. In his majesty. And it reminds me of Isaiah 6, chapter, uh, chapter 6, verse number 1. Where Isaiah says, in the year that King Uzziah died, I saw also the Lord sitting upon a throne. You know what that means? Sitting upon a throne. His work is finished. Hallelujah. The work is done. And he's sitting on the throne in his majesty. And then it says, high and lifted up. Exalted. Hallelujah. Exalted. But not only that, here's the part that I like, and sometimes we miss it because we don't, we don't fully grasp the picture that Isaiah is painting. But then it says, his train is not a choo-choo train. His train filled the temple. You ever see a bride walk in? Right? When the bride walks in, everybody rises and stands up. And they look so beautiful and they come down that aisle and then their train, here they come. They turn the corner and the train is still hasn't gone through yet. That's what the Lord has, his train, his robe of majesty, amen, that he walks in and we come into his presence. Hallelujah. His train has filled the temple and his train was made up of the king's train his robe was made up of victories every time the, there was a battle and the king won a victory there was a piece added to the train and can you imagine the train of the Lord hallelujah all the battles that he has won all that he's done for me all that he's done for you amen it's all added on and his train is filling the temple and we have the victory hallelujah great and mighty is our God. Hallelujah. He's awesome. He's victorious. He's our undefeated king. Woo! Let's sing that one more time. He's mighty. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Great and mighty is our God. Great and mighty is our God. Can you help us sing that this morning? Great and mighty, great and mighty is our God. Great and mighty, great and mighty is our God. Great and almighty is our God. We will love you, Jesus. Great and almighty is our God. Great and almighty. God. 
Somebody say hallelujah. Somebody say thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Lord. Hallelujah. Mm. Hallelujah. Sometimes if you just take a minute to be thoughtful, you'll be thankful. Hallelujah. Praise God. Praise the name of our Lord. You are great and you are mighty. You are victorious. We love you, Lord. I don't want to get routine. I don't want it to be a checkbox when we come on Sunday to say, I have made it here and check mark. No, it ought to be based on our relationship, based on a hunger and a desire to be in his presence. Hallelujah. Praise God. We're going to go to the word this morning. Romans chapter 8. Anybody dealing with obstacles in your life? Raise your hand. Amen. Every last one of us have an obstacle. We're going to talk about rising above life's obstacles today. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Romans chapter 8, verse 28. Familiar scripture. It says, And we know that all things work together for good to them that love God, to them who are called according to his purpose. For whom he did foreknow, he also did for, he also predestinate to be conformed to the image of his son that he might be the firstborn among many brethren moreover whom he did predestinate them he also called and whom he called them he also justified and whom he justified them he them he also glorified what shall we say what shall we then say to these things? It starts out by saying that we know that all things work together for good to them that love God. But he, in this, this 31st verse, he says, what then shall we say on these things? If God be for us, In the middle of your obstacle, in the middle of your challenge, in the middle of uncertainty, in the middle of not knowing if the next step you take is the very last, if the next breath you take is the very last, in the midst of whatever you might be dealing with, if God be for us, who can be against us? Hallelujah. He's given us everything that we need in order to rise above life's obstacles. Because in the middle of the obstacle, if we can only remember that all things work together for the good, it may not be a good situation, but God can turn it around for good. 
All things work together for the good to them that love God. That's the qualifier. To them that love God. To them who are the called according to his purpose. So God, you mean my obstacle has a purpose in it? My trial has a purpose? Praise God. Lord, we love you. We thank you for your word, for it is anointed. Anoint these lips of clay as I speak. Let every word that goes forth, let it accomplish that which you desire. For I have not come, Lord, with excellency of speech, but in the power of the Holy Ghost. Hallelujah. Have your way. In Jesus' name, everybody say amen. Amen. You may be seated. Praise God. If you've been alive for any length of time, you undoubtedly have gone through or are, have experienced obstacles in life. But the Word of God, if we take it as our guide, as our manual for living this life, it has everything we need as a solution in order to overcome every obstacle that comes our way. Amen. The way we do that, we're going to touch on today. Because I want to leave you with the thought and the understanding of knowing that we are able to rise above life's obstacles. So many times we don't... We don't uh, get to that next level or we don't feel like we're succeeding and we don't feel successful and it's only because our mind frame our mindset is not right it's going to take a mind shift it's going to take changing your mind it's going to take putting on the mind of Christ Philippians 2 verse 5 it says let this mind be in you which was also in Christ Jesus. In, a, in the NIV version, it says it this way. It says, in your relationships with one another, have the same mindset as Christ Jesus. See, when you know and you understand someone's mindset, you can predict their actions. You can predict how they are going to respond in various situations or circumstances when you know and you understand their mindset. That is why we are able to push people's buttons. Because we know their mind and we know how they think and how they respond to things and we're able to push their buttons and we're able to say certain things and know exactly what kind of response we're going to get. Amen. But then what, what does it really mean to put on the mind of Christ? The scripture says, let this mind be in you, which was also in Christ Jesus. Well, how do we put on this mind? How do we put on this mind of Christ? Right? In, in today's times, in, in the, today's terms, they've come up with the phrase, WWJD. What would... Jesus do right which is good it's good but let me first tell you in terms of putting on the mindset what it's like not to have the mind of Jesus it's going to Galatians chapter number 5 verse 19 listen listen to what it says the acts of the flesh are obvious sexual immorality impurity and debauchery idolatry and witchcraft hatred discord jealousy 
fits of rage, selfish ambition, dissensions, factions, and envy, drunkenness, orgies, and the like. That is quite a list. But those are the things that are the works or the acts of the flesh. But then he says, I warn you, as I did before, that those who live like this, live like what? Live like that list of things that I've just mentioned, will not inherit the kingdom of God. The word is clear. Will not inherit the kingdom of God. So that's what it's like when we don't have the mind of Christ. That's why it's possible that anyone can do anything at any given time when we don't have the mind of Christ. It shouldn't surprise us when we hear of the things that are going on, of different things that are wicked. Because when we don't have Christ, we are susceptible to doing anything. Anything. But these are the things that we do when we don't have the mind of Christ. However, when we do have the mind of Jesus, it's evident in the fruit that we produce. It's evident in our lives. It's evident in our walk. Well, what is fruit? Fruit is the end result of having gone through a process. Okay? Okay? Fruit does not just appear out of nowhere. Fruit comes from a fruit plant or a fruit tree. And before you can ever see that fruit, that fruit would have to have gone through a process in order for it to appear. And that process is, first you'll take a seed. And you do what with it? You plant it. You plant that seed and you water it. And allow that seed to begin to germinate and to grow. And before long, you'll have something start to sprout out of the ground and you'll have yourself a plant. And that plant will start to grow, but that plant needs something. It needs some sunlight in order to begin to grow. And so that seed that now starts to grow with the sunlight and over time, this is part of the process, over time, it develops from that little plant into... A tree. And then from the tree, eventually, what you start to have is fruits begin to appear. Fruits begin to appear. Well, putting on the mind of Jesus means that we have to go through a process. We have to go through a process. And it's not unlike the seed. See, when we, when we take that seed and we, we plant it into the ground and we start to water it, that's the Word of God. The Word of God is that, is that seed that gets planted in our hearts. And it begins to germinate. And faith, it begins to work together with faith and it becomes activated. Okay? And as that faith and that, that, that Word begins to activate, just like in the natural where you now start to see a plant growing, we in the spiritual now, with, with that faith and that seed, we have to go through a process. And we have to, it brings us to a place where we recognize our faults. And when that happens, we do what? We repent. When the word of God comes in and it begins to activate, it should bring repentance out of us. And so as we start to repent, which means taking an about face from the direction we were going, we now start to go towards God. We start to move towards God. So just as the seed is planted and it starts to grow, our spiritual word is planted and it starts to grow, and we start to move towards God. But the natural needed another element, and that element was the sunlight. In order for it to continue to grow. Because you can't have growth or life in the darkness. And I know there's special plants under in the sea, in the ocean, at the bottom that doesn't require sunlight. But generally speaking, you don't have it with you don't have any growth without sunlight. 
And so just like in the natural that needs the sunlight, we, after the word of faith has been activated in us and we've repented and we begin, begin to, to grow, we need some sunlight. S-O-N light. Amen. We need to begin to allow the Holy Ghost to work in our lives. We need to begin to allow the Holy Spirit to manifest and to move. And just like over time that plant now develops into a tree, then we start as babes with milk, right? And I talked about that a few weeks ago. Milk is for babies, and so milk is good, but we don't want to stay at the level of milk. We have to grow, and we have to go from milk to cereal, from cereal to solid foods. That is the process. And then eventually, just like with the natural plant, that you'll see the fruit, the evidence of what type of plant it is, the evidence in our lives become visible. How? Through the fruit of the Spirit. We now begin to encourage others. We now get to a place where we begin to teach others. We begin to make disciples of others. Are you with me? It's a process. And so when fruit starts to appear, we know that we're growing because a dead plant can't manifest fruit. Amen. Now watch what it says in the next few verses in Galatians 5, 22 and 23, regarding the fruit. But the fruit of the Spirit is love, is joy, it's peace, forbearance, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, and self-control. Against such things there is no law. See, fruit is the... Is, is the transformation or it's the result of allowing the Holy Ghost to begin to work and activate in our lives to transform us. And so, Corinthians, 2 Corinthians, Corinthians 3 verse 18 says this. And we all, who with unveiled faces contemplate the Lord's glory are being transformed into his image with ever increasing glory which comes from the Lord who is the spirit unveiled faces meaning that we're we're no longer seeing through through darkness the Spirit begins to manifest and work in our lives. And the glory of God begins to shine. Amen. And we are beginning to be transformed into His image. Into His image. We're talking about putting on the mindset of Christ. Amen. Putting on the mindset of Christ. So then Paul, in the back to Galatians chapter 5, a little bit further. Before the verses we read in verse 16, he says this, This I say then, walk in the Spirit, and you shall not fulfill the lust of the flesh. Are you piecing it together? See, he gives us all the works of the flesh. And he gives us the fruit of the spirit when we allow the spirit to move and manifest in our lives but then or before he even begins to lay all that out he says then i say walk in the spirit and you shall not fulfill the lust of the flesh in other words the things that i listed out that were the acts or the works of the flesh they can be avoided Amen. they can be avoided but the only way they can be avoided is if we begin to walk in the Spirit. And don't look at things with the natural eyes, but look at them with spiritual eyes. Look at them and recognize that devil, you are tempting me. I'm not going to fall for this temptation. Amen. Amen. Because we know that we wrestle not against flesh and blood. 
but against principalities and powers and wickedness in high places. And we talked about what principalities were on Thursday. Those are angelic beings. In this case, we're wrestling against demonic forces. Amen. So we have to have a Christ mindset in order to rise above life's obstacles. There are people that, that are uh, struggling with different challenges, different obstacles. Some might be addiction. Some might, it might be hurt. Some it might be, you know, you fill in the blank. What is your hurt? What is your obstacle? What is the situation that you are dealing with? Can I tell you that if you were to put on the mind of Christ, you will be able to rise above every obstacle. Because we serve a God who has defeated the enemy. And because he has defeated the enemy... We are victorious. We are victorious. So we have to have a Christ mindset in order to rise above the obstacles. But that change, it happens from within. It happens from within. Any change from within can only happen through the Holy Ghost. Because that's how the Holy Ghost operates. The Holy Ghost comes in and it begins to work from the inside out. See, but when we try to do it, how do we do it? We try to work from the outside and we try to work our way in. But God said, no, 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 it doesn't work that way. Start from the inside and begin to allow my spirit to change your mind, to change uh, how you function, to change your character. Your character. And what is your character? Character is who you are and is what you do when no one else is around. It's not what you do when I can see you. It's not what you do when your neighbor can see you. It's not what you do when your wife can't, can see you. It's what you do when no one can see you. That is who your character is. And your character will inevitably surface you can hide it but for so long before it, it becomes visible so any change that occurs it doesn't occur from the outside coming in it occurs from the inside out what did Jesus say to the Pharisees you hypocrites you take the cup and you do what? You wipe it down and you wipe it on the outside. You need to wipe on the inside. We need to start from the inside and allow him to start to work on the inside. Allow him to start to work on our hearts. Allow him to start to work on our mindset. And when our mindset changes... Then the fruit becomes visible. The fruit is the last piece that you see. After the seed's been planted, after the growth, after the sunlight, after the process of time and water and everything starts to happen, when that tree gets to that point of maturity where it's able to bear fruit, then the fruit comes out. It's a process. It's a process. So any changes from within can only happen through the Holy Ghost. And there's three ways that the Holy Ghost make us like Jesus. And what does it mean to be like Jesus? Or what does it mean to be Christians? It means to be Christ-like. It means to be Christ-like. It means to have a Christ-like character. Okay, so the first thing, there's three ways the Holy Ghost makes us like Jesus. The first way that the Holy Ghost makes us like Jesus is that the Holy Ghost uses truth. Truth. In order to produce a Christ-like character in our lives. 
Look at 2 Timothy chapter 3, verse 15. And that from a child thou hast known the holy scriptures, which are able to make thee wise unto salvation through faith which is in Christ Jesus. All scripture is given by inspiration of God and is profitable for doctrine, for reproof, for correction, for instruction in righteousness. The truth of God's word is able to produce a Christ-like character. In verse 17, it says that the man of God may be perfect, thoroughly furnished unto all good works. Allowing the word of truth to transform you. Amen. Psalms 19 verse 7 says this. The law of the Lord is perfect, refreshing the soul. The statutes of the Lord are trustworthy, making wise the simple. The precepts of the Lord are right, giving joy to the heart. The commands of the Lord are radiant, giving light to the eyes. And then in verse 9, the fear of the Lord is pure, enduring forever. The decrees of the Lord are firm, and all of them are righteous. They are more precious than gold, than much pure gold. They are sweeter than honey, than honey from the honeycomb. By them your servant is warned, in keeping them there is great Reward. In other words, taking the word of God, the truth of the word of God, and allowing that, amen, to be the, uh, the plumb line that you live your life by will exhibit a transformation in your life that will bring about a great reward. A great reward. So truth is the first way that the Holy Ghost makes us like Christ. But the second way that the Holy Ghost makes us like Christ is that the Holy Ghost uses people. The Holy Ghost uses people to produce a Christ-like character. Here's what God gives us. He gives us first, he gives us truth, but then he gives us people. Look at Ephesians chapter 4 verse 11. And we're going to go in depth in this as part of our study in Ephesians, but we're going to touch on it lightly here. Verse 11, it says, And he gave some apostles and some prophets and some evangelists and some pastors and teachers for the perfecting of the saints, for the work of the ministry, for the edifying of the body of Christ. So what did he give? He gave apostles he gave prophets he gave if he gave evangelists he gave pastors and he gave teachers he gave people he's put certain things within the body of the church to allow us to transform our minds so first is his word there's truth and that's something you can grasp for yourself in the word of god but then he gives us people he gives us individuals that we can go to, that we can learn from. Amen. People that can mentor us. People that will give you accountability. If you, don't, if you have a struggle with something, you know what? You need an accountability partner. You need to have someone that you can go to that can hold you accountable. And when I say that, you have to grant them permission. You have to give them permission to speak into your life. Because if you don't do that, they might say certain things that you're not going to like. But it might, it, it's going to be truth. But you might not like it. So he's given us what we need and he's put these things within the church. There should be no reason... For us to not be able to rise above the obstacles of life. Only if we say, oh, you know what? We're going to go at it alone. I've got this. I, I can do it.
but he's given us what we need. And in verse 13, he says that he's given us these things, right, for the edifying of the body of Christ till we all come in the unity of the faith and the knowledge of the Son of God unto a perfect man, unto the measure of the stature of the fullness of Christ. That we henceforth be no more children tossed to and fro and carried about with every wind of doctrine by the slight of men and cunning craftiness and whereby they lie in wait to deceive. This is talking about the growth process, right? When that seed gets planted, you now begin to grow. But he says that henceforth be no more children. In other words, you have to grow in this thing. You've got to grow in your relationship with Christ. You've got to grow in your Christianity, in your walk. Praise God. We've got to grow. He says no more children. But tossed and tossed to and fro and carried about with every wind of doctrine. You ever see people that they're, you know, they're going here and they're going there. They're looking for the next, um, I got to be careful with my words here. They're looking for excitement. They're looking for the next best thing. And so they're going here and they're going there and they're going everywhere. But they never stay in one place long enough to be grounded, to be rooted, to allow the Holy Ghost to work from the inside out. They're constantly trying to satisfy the external. And that's why they're going from here to there. And the scripture says that you're going to get tossed to and fro with every wind of doctrine. You know, there's, there's a doctrine over here. There's a doctrine over there, and you start to go wherever you think uh, the latest doctrine is, the latest revelation is happening. Praise God. Henceforth, that no children tossed to and fro and carried about with every wind of doctrine by the slight of men. But if you go to verse 15, but speaking the truth in love may grow up into him in all things which is the head, even Christ, from whom the whole body fitly joined joined together and compacted by that which every joint supplieth according to the effectual working in the measure of every part, maketh increase of the body into the edifying of itself in love. That's a mouthful. But here's what it's basically saying. When you stop moving to and fro and looking for every wind of doctrine and you stay grounded in the word of God, in the truth of God, God will supply people in your life and that will help you to grow, okay? And then when, you, when, when they've helped you to grow, you know what your responsibility is? Say it again. Teaching someone else. And this is what it's saying. From whom the whole body fitly joined together and compacted by that which every joint supplieth according to the effectual working measure of every part. That means we each individual here have a part to play within the body. We can't all be the ear. We can't all be the head or the nose or the eyes. Some are going to be the ears. Some are going to be the nose. You know what? Some are going to be the big toe. It doesn't sound attractive, but guess what? You know what? If you don't have a big toe, you're off balance. Every part is needed. Every part is needed. So he gives us the fivefold ministry to help you with this walk, with our Christian walk. So, and along with leadership, God also uses our brothers and our sisters to produce a Christ-like character in us. Brother Nestor, he mentioned at the start during prayer that iron sharpeneth iron. 
Guess what? You know what happens when iron sharpens iron? When you take iron and you start to sharpen it, you know what starts to happen? Sparks start to fly. It doesn't always feel good, but it's good for you. Amen. If you have a brother or you have a sister, someone who's encouraging you, who's saying, you know what? You need to be in the house of God. They hadn't seen you in a couple of weeks and they reached out and they said, where have you been? You need to be in the house of God. Don't get offended by it. Receive it. Because it's iron sharpening iron. Praise God. Praise God. First Peter chapter 4. says this, verse 8. Above all, love each other deeply because love covers a multitude of sins. Offer hospitality one or to one another without grumbling. Each of you should use whatever gift you have received to do what? To serve, to serve others as faithful stewards of God's grace in its various forms. Faithful stewards of God's grace. You know what a steward is? Steward is someone who manages something on behalf of someone else. And so if we are stewards of God's grace, God is expecting us to be good managers of his grace and to give grace to others. Amen. You know why? Because with the same measure that we judge is the same measure God is going to judge us. And so he's saying, be graceful, be merciful to your brother and to your sister. So that we know he's going to be merciful to us. Amen. Amen. So that's, that's the second thing is God uses people to produce Christ-like character. The third is that the, the Holy Ghost uses circumstances to produce a Christ-like character. In 2 Corinthians 4, 17, it says this, For our light and momentary troubles are achieving for us an eternal glory that far outweighs them all. In other words, your situation, your circumstance that you are dealing with it's just a momentary trouble that has come your way that's there to help you achieve an eternal glory. Don't look at it, and we, I preached on this a few weeks ago. Don't look at things and say, God, why am I in this circumstance? Why am I in this situation? But look at it and say, God, what am I to? Come on. Learn, learn. I want to see who's been paying attention. What am I to learn in this situation? Because if you don't learn anything, you know what happens when you're in fifth grade? Well, I probably shouldn't use this example because it doesn't happen anymore. They just seem to pass them on, pass them along. But back in my day, if you failed a class... You know what happens? You fail to learn the material. Guess what happens? You get left back. Why do, why do they leave you behind? So that you can repeat it, so you can learn it. If we fail to learn what we're supposed to in the circumstance that we're in, we're going to repeat it again. Israel was ready to, God was ready to take Israel to the promised land. And they get there and all they see is giants in the land and they didn't learn the lesson that when they have an obstacle that God is setting them up for a miracle. 
It's just like when they came across the Red Sea and they didn't have anywhere to go. The seas behind them and Far or the seas before them and Pharaoh's behind them. When you find yourself in a situation of impossibility, can I tell you that God is setting you up for a miracle? He's setting you up for a blessing. Amen. So he uses our circumstances in order to produce a Christ-like character. But if we don't learn what we are supposed to learn within our circumstance, then we are going to inevitably repeat it until we learn. That's why he had to let the entire generation that didn't believe first die off in the wilderness with the exception of Caleb and Joshua. They had to repeat it, but it wasn't their fault. It wasn't their fault. Now of these three things, what were they? First one was, second one was, and then the third is our, praise God. Well, I'm done. You're paying attention. Truth, people, and our circumstances. But in all three of those, guess what? There's one of them that God uses most often. Circumstances. He uses circumstances on a regular basis. And you know what? We find ourselves struggling the most with our circumstances. Because truth, we can go to the word and we can, we can see the truth and we'll receive it. We can go to someone and, and if we like what they do, we accept it. If we don't like, we just keep on moving. We reject it, but no harm. Hey, I didn't like what he said. I'll move on. But that's not what God wants. That's not what he wants. That's why he, he specifically outlines those people that I talked about that he puts in your life. But we're able to get beyond that. But our circumstances, it just seems to keep gnawing and gnawing at you and pushing and pushing. And we can't control it. You have some level of control over truth. You have some level of control over people. But you have no control over the circumstances that you come across. Amen. But within every circumstance, God has a purpose behind it. Every obstacle has a purpose. It has a purpose. What did we start out by saying? We know that all things work together for the good. In other words, everything has a purpose behind it. And if we would focus on the purpose, God would speak to us. Amen. Amen. God develops the fruit of the Spirit in our life by allowing us to experience these circumstances. And what happens when we experience these circumstances is through the circumstance, God normally, normally we're tempted to respond in the way that is the exact opposite of the fruit that God is trying to develop in us. You ever notice that? If God is working on patience and he brings a situation in your life, the last thing you want to do is wait. The last thing you want to do is wait. If he, if he brings a situation in your life where he's working on love, man, that person rubs you in such a way, the last thing you want to do is show them some love. 
If he's working on peace, allowing you to, to have peace as a fruit, the last thing you want is peace. When that circumstance comes, you're like, you know it's, you should have peace, but it's just, mm. amen, somebody. Amen. amen. So when he's developing these things, it becomes difficult. And that's where growth happens. If there's no resistance, there's no growth. If there's no change, there's no growth. And I'll finish with this. There's four kinds of obstacles in life that you will need to rise above. And it doesn't matter what you're dealing with, it's going to fall into one of these four obstacles. The first one is the trials. The trials come as an obstacle, and when the trials come, it's designed by God to draw you closer to him and to build up your character. Okay, the second one is, it's temptations. Temptations come from the enemy because he's trying to draw you away from God. He's trying to draw you away from God. The third obstacle is trespasses. It's trespasses. Trespasses, what are trespasses? They are, they are hurts and the sins that other people cause. That's why when Jesus gave the, the example of the prayer, he says, what about the trespasses? Forgive us our, because we're going to do it. We're going to offend somebody. We're going to hurt people. Forgive us of our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us, as we forgive those who hurt us. That's the other obstacle, the hurt, the obstacle of hurt. You know there are people who are lost today simply because they were hurt. Let me get more specific. They are lost today simply because they were hurt by church. Somebody said something. And it may have been the pastor, it may have been a leader, it might have just been a fellow member in the church, but somebody said something that hurt them, and they couldn't let it go. They couldn't get past the hurt, and so they left church, they left God because of something someone did, because of a trespass. Don't let trespasses become an obstacle that you cannot overcome. Yes, you can overcome the trespasses. Amen. And then the fourth one is troubles. Troubles. Troubles are usually a result or the consequences of our own actions or our own choices. You ever find yourself in a situation and you're thinking, man, how did I get here? And when you start to examine it and you start to kind of, uh, I like to call it backwards engineer the situation. That means you, you're looking at the result and you're saying, okay, well, how did I get and end up with this result? And as you start to backtrack it, you realize that it was a choice that you made that allowed you to get to where you are. Our own choices. So I will end with this. Because it's not enough to give you these four obstacles without giving you how to overcome them. Because that's what the Word of God is. The Word of God doesn't say uh, the world is lost and it's dying. 
If he just said that, we'd all be in trouble. But he says that the world is lost and in dying, but there is a Savior. There is hope in the middle of the darkness. There is hope in the middle of your obstacle. There is a God who's able to do exceeding abundantly above all that you can think or even ask. Praise God. So here's how you overcome life's obstacles. Here's how you rise above life's obstacles. Remember, I gave you four obstacles. So if the obstacle is a trouble, something that, that was a result of your own actions, then the way you overcome that obstacle is you have to repent. Lord, forgive me. I made a mistake. I made a choice that has led me down this path. Praise God. Uh, Genesis 42, 21. Here's what it says. This is Joseph, the story of Joseph and his brothers. It says, they said to one another, surely we are being punished because of our brother. We saw how distressed he was when he pleaded with us for his life. But we would not listen. That's why this distress has come on us. Hallelujah. Joseph was testing his brothers to see, have they changed? Or are they still the same? That's why he took Benjamin. He said, let me see how they respond, how they react. Has there been change in their lives? Have they grown from their childish stunt of throwing me into that pit? Are they still on milk? Or are they now on solid food? So if it's a trouble, you have to repent. If it's a temptation, which we said that the, tempt the temptations are from the enemy. They're from the devil. You overcome by resisting. By resisting. Matthew 26, 41 says, Watch and pray that you enter not into temptation. The spirit indeed is willing, but the flesh is weak. That's all temptation is. Temptation is giving in a momentarily submission to the flesh. And I say momentary, you know why? Because the minute you give in and you've, you've, you've gone into the temptation... You start to have regret. Why did I do that? How did I allow that to happen? How did I fall into this trap? Well, the only way that you can overcome that is you need to resist. James 1.14 says, But every man is tempted when he is drawn away of his own lust and enticed. But here's the answer. It's in James 4, 7. Submit yourselves, therefore, to God. Resist the devil, and he will flee from you. Praise God. And the last two, trespass and trial. Let's stand. If it's a trespass, if it's something that was done against you, or something that you did against someone else, you know how you overcome a trespass? You have to release it. You have to let it go. Don't harbor it. Don't, don't, don't bury it because we know what happens with things we bury. They start to grow. They start to grow. So we have to learn to release it. Luke 17 verse 4 says, And if he trespass against thee seven times in a day, And seven times in a day turn again to thee, saying, I repent. 
In other words, if they offend you seven times, if they do something that hurts you seven times in one day, that can get pretty, pretty annoying. But if they say, I'm sorry, brother. I'm sorry, sister. Listen, he says, thou shalt forgive him. That person, that individual that, that walked away because of hurt. Sometimes it's because the person never came and said, I'm sorry. But can I tell you, even if they never come to you to say, I am sorry, remember the art of reconciliation. You have to let it go. You've got to be willing to say, you know what? I forgive them. And it's not just words. You, just, you don't just say, I forgive them and you move on. But you have to go to that individual and find them and say, you know what? Brother, you did something that I don't know if you even know you did it or not. If you did it intentionally or accidentally. But it hurt me. I forgive you. You know what that does? It releases not only that individual, but it releases you from that hurt. That's allowing the spirit to work from the inside out. Because from the outside, you want to retaliate. Amen? Amen. And lastly, it's the trial. It's the trial. Trials, they are allowed by God. Yes, it may be the enemy. Pharaoh was running after Israel, after the nation. When they came across the Red Sea, he started coming after them. But the only reason he was coming after them in the first place was because God allowed it. And if God allowed it, that he's going to deliver you. Amen. He's going to make a way. Paul says this in Romans chapter 5. Not only, uh, 5 verse 3. Not only so, but we also glory in our sufferings. Because we know that suffering produces perseverance. James 1, 2 says, Consider it pure joy, my brothers and sisters, whenever you face trials of many kinds, because you know that the testing of your faith produces perseverance. And a little bit further down in verse 12, James says, Blessed is the one who perseveres under trial, because having stood the test, that person will receive the crown of life that the Lord has promised to those who love them. Hallelujah. Your trial, you know how you overcome your trial? You start to rejoice. You start to give God praise. You start to give God glory. Hallelujah. Lord, I thank you for this trial. Lord, I want to learn what it is you are trying to teach me in this circumstance. 
Hallelujah. Lord, I don't want to repeat it, but I want to learn everything that you have for me to learn because I know that once I've learned it, hallelujah, that you are going to deliver me. You are going to, hallelujah, help me to overcome this situation. You are going to help me to rise above the obstacle. You are going to make a way out of no way. Hallelujah. First Peter 1 verse 6 and 7 says, In all this you greatly rejoice. Though now for a little while you may have had to suffer grief in all kinds of trials. These have come. In other words, your trials have come so that the proven genuineness of your faith of greater worth than gold which perishes even though refined by fire may result in praise glory and honor when Jesus Christ is revealed Hallelujah. If you've been challenged by life's obstacles, I want to tell you today that the Holy Ghost will help you to rise above every obstacle. And if you don't have the Holy Ghost, you can have it today. You can be filled today because this walk it's going to take the Holy Ghost to walk it with us it's going to take the Holy Ghost to lead us to guide us when you look at the times that we're living in right now the things that are happening you know it, Five years ago, even a year and a half ago, it's a completely different perspective on the sufferings that God has talked about in his word that are to come. That if he doesn't shorten the time, even the very elect won't make it. You know what that means? We need the Holy Ghost. We need, hallelujah, the presence and the power of God working in our lives so that we can resist the enemy, so that we can resist the temptations, so that we can overcome the trials, so that we can be victorious in the troubles. Hallelujah. Praise God. Let's raise our hands. Jesus, we love you. We submit. We surrender. Have your way, Lord. Have your way.